So thank you all for joining us today for part two of this uh, series, very, very interesting series about connecting citizen science with uh, remote sensing. My name is Juan Torres Perez. Um, today, as always, I'm joined by my two colleagues uh, from the NASA Ames Research Center, Amber McCollum and Brittany Beaudry. Um, today, uh, we will also be joined by Alison Kuzik, and in the in the Spanish version by Martina Mascioni, who will later be speaking about a NASA-funded citizen science project uh, called Fior Fido. Now, as a reminder, for this training, we have three different sessions. Uh, each of them is about an hour and a half long. Uh, on January 24th, so today the 26th, and on the 31st. Remember that this is a bilingual training and where we are presenting the same material in English from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And then again in Spanish from 2 to 3.30 uh, p.m. Eastern Time. And here's uh, the course uh, website where you can find all the materials, including the recordings uh, to the, to the, uh, in the, via YouTube and also the presentation materials, and eventually you will get a link to the homework. And we'll talk about the homework in the, in the next, next slide. As always, at the end of each session, we will have a question and answer session where we will display your questions and transcribe the answers on a document that eventually will make it available also on the, on the website. But if by any chance we're not able to answer your particular question, feel free to send us an email to either myself or Amber or Brittany, and we will answer it uh, as soon as we can. Okay. Like I said, in, uh, like we said last week, uh, there's a one homework assignment to complete for this course and will need to be submitted by Google Forms. The homework will be, be will become available on the course website on the last day of the training, so next week. And you will have uh, two weeks after that to complete the homework. It's a very simple homework. Uh, so you will have until February 14 to submit it. Now, to obtain the certificate of completion, you will need to attend the live webinars and submit the assignment, like I said, and on or before February 14. And if you attend all the sessions and you complete the homework uh, by the deadline, eventually you will receive a certificate of completion. Now remember, please be patient because as you know, uh, these RCET trainings are, are taken by a lot of people. So it takes a, a couple of months for us to, pro to process and eventually to send out uh, those certificates. Here's a course uh, outline. As mentioned, we will have we are having three sessions. In the first session, we provided an overview of what citizen science is about, and then we heard about uh, the citizen science at NASA in particular. Today, in the second session, we will review examples of water resources uh, or coastal ocean applications, um, and then in the third session. Uh, next week, we will review examples of land applications of citizen science project. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, remember that we are definitely concentrating on, on citizen science projects that have been funded by NASA. By the end of this training, we hope uh, you all be able to outline key aspects of citizen science projects, including community engagement and effective communication, motivation, ethics and policies, data quality assurance and accessibility, and be able to summarize applications for Earth, uh, of Earth observations for citizen science. And like I mentioned before, throughout this series, we're also highlighting case study examples on the use of Earth observations for NASA uh, projects. Here's the agenda for today. First, we're gonna give a short summary of the topics that we covered uh, this past Tuesday in session one. Then 
we will dedicate the rest of the today's session to showcase some of the NASA funded citizen science projects specifically designed for water and coastal applications. In particular, we are going to focus on four different projects. Uh, flooring forest, which we already highlighted during our uh, monitoring aquatic vegetation with remote sensing webinar last year. Uh, Fjord Fido, lake observations by citizen scientists and satellites, or LOCs. And NEMONET, which is a neural multimodal application for global coral reef assessments. Okay, so here's a short summary of part one. First, we talked uh, about general aspects of citizen science and how to get involved, uh, the benefits or and drawbacks of citizen science, uh, community engagement and feedback, different levels of participation, depending on the availability and depending also on the expertise of the citizens, how to get the word out about your project and engage people, uh, maintain how to maintain the the interest of, of participants through throughout the length of your project, how to establish uh, standardized protocols for data collection and submission, and uh, obviously data uh, review and also uh, data uh, curation. We also uh, talked about NASA's uh, citizen science. And in summary, the NASA Citizen Science program supports projects in diverse areas, including planetary science, heliophysics, and, and earth sciences. And more than so far, more than 400 citizen scientists have even co-authored peer-reviewed publications on some of these projects. Now, specifically uh, within uh, NASA Citizen Science program, there's a Citizen Science for Earth Systems program that focuses on projects aimed at atmospheric and also biospheric sciences. And it aims to advance the use of citizen science, uh, science in science, scientific research, particularly about the Earth, uh, by supporting activities uh, from, with citizen scientists and deploying technologies to further the research in citizen science. Now, all funded projects uh, must have a clear linkage between citizen science and NASA's observation systems. Now, with that short summary of uh, what we talked about last week, now let's talk about some examples of NASA funded projects that use citizen science specifically uh, to, 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 to work with water-based uh, observations, be that inland, as in the case of lakes, and also coastal or ocean applications. The first one that we're going to talk about is Floating Forest. Floating Forest is a citizen science online tool for monitoring kelp extension, mainly along the west coast of the U.S., although new data is being incorporated from other parts of the world. Now, before we go into the tool, let's talk uh, in very, very broad details about kelps. Despite their appearance, uh, kelps are, not, are algae, they're not plants. They're brown algae, it's uh, from a class called Phyophysi, and Macrocystis is one of the most dominant genera of kelps and forms uh, some of the biggest individuals, with some of them reaching several dozens of meters in length. Also, kelps in general are probably some of the fastest growing types of algae uh, in the world. Uh, some of them can grow up to 18 inches a day. Now, hundreds of marine invertebrates and fishes depend on the kelp forest for their survival, food, and shelter from predators. Also, mammals such as sea otters and seals can be found within the kelp forest, and many aquatic birds also feed on the small fishes and invertebrates that live among the blades of the kelp forest at the water surface. Now, new estimates, which incorporate data from the Arctic now, show that the kelp coverage to uh, the kelp coverage to be about two million square kilometers. So about 36% of the world's coastline, making it the largest marine biome in our planet, 
with seagrasses, coral reefs, and mangrove forests following in terms of extension. This is a huge area that obviously cannot be monitored with traditional methods. And here's where citizen science can actually help. Now, Florin Forest uses uh, consensus classifications to crowdsource the detection of giant kelps using 30 years of Landsat data. Full size, in, in, in a, here's a, a short, short summary of the process that it, that it, uh, that it involves. Uh, full size Landsat scenes uh, are converted by the research team into small JPEG subsets that are presented then to citizen scientists via the floating forest uh, classification interface. For each region, for, for instance, in the, uh, California, and they also have now data with, uh, from Tanzania, uh, and from, I mean, from Tasmania, uh, the researchers used uh, uh, NOAA's World Vector Shoreline data set to identify the path and rows of Landsat overpasses that contain coastlines. They then downloaded all available images from each path row from the USGS uh, Landsat archives, and each Landsat image is converted to top of the atmosphere reflectance using seeing specific bias and gain values, Earth sun's distance and sonar zenith, zenith angle, among other types of metadata. Then they split each Landsat scene into 400 images of equal size along uh, 20 by 20 grids. So roughly about 131 square kilometers per image. Each image subset uh, is then displayed uh, with the short wave infrared band as red, the near infrared band as green, and the red band as blue. And this band combination is ideal for kelp detection uh, at the surface waters, as the uh, the high near infrared reflectance of kelp canopy causes it to stand out as bright, bright green in the images, similar to what we're showing here in the in the figure on the on the right hand. Now, Florin Forest was launched within the Sooner Sooniverse platform uh, around 2014. And then after some changes in the processing pipeline, uh, the tool was uh, also relaunched again in 2017. There are two ways in which uh, users can classify kelp here. The first one, in the first one, the users are presented with an image where they simply indicate whether there's there are kelps or not. And uh, uh, here, sometimes they will get images that are either bad images uh, meaning there's an issue with the image, it's cloudy or, or such, and the users can also report that as well. Um, many times, uh, it just so happens, just because of the amount of, the, of data that it's uh, embedded into, kelp, into into floating forests, that it might not even have a coastline and, and, and obviously no no kelps. Um, the other way is it's a little bit more advanced that people can can also classify kelps. And here the users are presented with an image. And if it has kelps, then they can manually delineate the kelp patches along the coastlines. The results are compared to the results from other users as a method of, of validation. And one good thing about Florin Forest is that uh, users can send a comment to the, to the researchers to let them know if there's something wrong uh, with a particular image or if there are doubts uh, about a specific kelp patch. Now, Florin Forest has become very popular among users. And on each day, more than 1,000 classifications are uh, registered in the application. And so far, there are almost 25,000 people registered uh, using Florin Forest. In fact, here's a graph that I downloaded from the application uh, at the end of last year, and it shows the number of classifications submitted uh, to that day by, by time period. And as of December of uh, 2022, more than, here, well, more than 1,350,000 classifications have been submitted by citizen scientists through throwing forests. This is amazing. 
um, imagine, just imagine if this would be, if it would, this would have been done by the small team of researchers that manage the application alone. I, I can't imagine how long it would take them for to do something like this uh, just by themselves. This shows how important citizen science can be in producing extremely valuable inform the information and data that can help monitor such important ecosystems like the kelp forest. Now, as mentioned before, each classification is dep depurated and meaning that it's uh, compared to others for consistency and for data quality assurance. Uh, a very interesting aspect is that it not only not always uh, the kelp patches and are clearly defined in the image. This is affected by the extension of the pa of the patch, uh, the cover, the phenology or the life stage of the organisms and seasonality, and the density of the canopy cover. Therefore, it, it is expected that the denser, the larger, and the healthier patches are more easily identified than others. And this is precisely what is shown here in this heat map uh, example on the right hand side. Uh, obtained this is data obtained from from the tool and, and from a paper published uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, and here the data shows that the number of users that correctly identify in a particular patch increases as the patch becomes more and more evident uh, on the image on the on the left hand side. Now, let's see a, a short demo of how the application of foreign forest, uh, floating forest works. Uh, this is something that I recorded back in July of last year. Um, well, 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 let's see the, the short demo, and then we will come back again to see other examples of citizen science projects. Okay, so like I said, this is a, this is a citizen science tool that uh, was developed a few years ago. Is, uh, it was actually funded uh, through the NASA Citizen Science Program, and uh, and it's a it's a very neat tool be, uh, for that where people can can provide uh, can classify and provide data for uh, for, for, for 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 kelp forests in particular, and, uh, and and it includes several parts of around the world, several uh, sites around the world. And, uh, and let's just take a look at it. Uh, this is the main uh, web page of, uh, of uh, Floating Forest. It's actually managed through the, the, the Suniverse uh, domain. And, and actually, if you go into Suniverse, and we're not going to go uh, into a lot of details here just because of time. But if you go into, let's say, projects within Suniverse, you'll see that there's a bunch of different projects, a number of different projects. Uh, all of them are citizen science projects related to, well, actually, you see here, there's 101 right now, uh, including floating forests and anything from arts, biology, climate, history, you name it. So I encourage you, here as you can see, uh, some of them are related to, to biology, the spy fishing uh, uh, here, and also the seabird watch as well. So uh, yeah, I encourage you to go into Suniverse and and, and take a look at some of those projects. You might be interested in, 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 in some of them and, and hopefully also in, in flooring forests. So what we'll see here, we're just gonna, it, you'll see that it has a, an area where it just talks about the importance of kelps and, uh, and also um, some of the things that we discussed earlier uh, during this, uh, during, during this uh, uh, part. And uh, and then why do we need help and such and obviously acknowledgements and uh, and uh, uh, for NASA and, and other people that are, other agencies that have supported it. So let's uh, let's just see some of the features. What you will do is when you go into for, uh, flooring forest uh, for the first time, there's an area and here's I'm already locked in here, but uh, but I'll show you. There's a um, there's a I, I would be signing out, but I'm not going to do it today. But uh, but uh, you will be pretty much creating an account there. Obviously, this is free, and then you will go. You will have the opportunity to either go into find urban kelp, which is just K 
tropical forests that are uh, at or nearby uh, urban areas in several parts around the world. Uh, this one is uh, uh, what it will show is uh, it will take you to a site where or to a place where you just you're just gonna you're just gonna answer whether you see or not or you don't see kelps in that particular image that that, that they're giving you, and then you move on to on to another image uh, once you submit that data. And the other one is uh, is actually. Uh, called, uh, for classifying kelps on the in New Zealand in in, in particular, and in, uh, this one is a little bit different, and I believe it's right now it's uh, it's, it's on the on their uh, new development, but uh, but we will take a look at it uh, in a moment. Um, so let's just go, and then and then when you go into classify here, it will uh, take you to uh, either of them. There's a there's actually a collection here uh, uh, where you see the images that have already been classified by other people. And uh, and just to show you, I wanted to, to see if I could show you some of the data. Here it is. Right now, as of, as of uh, July, there's more than 23,000 volunteers, um, citizen scientists that have been classifying data, almost 1.2 million classifications um, from <clears throat> from different parts of the world again and uh, and, and there's uh, that's uh, even more the more uh, statistical uh, statistics here here you see they've gone through several uh, uh, iterations of this um, we're going what we're gonna see today is uh, what they have, what they have available at the moment which is finding urban kelp and also classifying kelp on the uh, New Zealand you see some of them say 100% complete, some are 50% complete of, of what is uh, there. But in any case, even if it says, as, you, as you'll see, when let's say in the New Zealand one, even if it says 100% complete, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't classify an image from there. It will still give you an image and you can still do a classification. And uh, and then what it has is that uh, it, there's a, uh, uh, when you go into the collections, you might even find an image that has already been classified by several people. And you can even compare the classifications of, 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 of some of them. So let's just go back um, for a moment here, and let's just go into the fine urban kelp. And I will, I will, uh, I will just tell you uh, uh, as of, uh, right now, you will see that a lot of the images that it contains do not necessarily, uh, that, it, that, that are already uploaded, uh, don't necessarily contain any kelp data. That is why this is, uh, this is uh, the task that is asking you is just to, 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 to see, just to, to mention if there is or, not, or there isn't kelp in this image. So for instance, obviously this is an image that it's a, it's a land-based uh, image, and uh, and actually a lot of them are from the Landsat 7. So you'll see that a lot of them have the, you know, the striping issue of the of, uh, of the Landsat 7 images. This one, for instance, uh, obviously it's from land, so I would just say no, there's no kelp. You can either go here down and talk, and uh, and there you can uh, you can uh, write something down and and eventually get some response back. But let's just say for the for the sake of this, well, we're gonna click here on done. And here's what I told you: there's, there's, you're gonna be you're gonna see a lot of images. Don't get frustrated. It's just that it's, uh, it's the way that the that the, uh, uh, the software is built. But eventually, you might even get an image that has some kelp. This one it, uh, doesn't seem to have to, to show kelp. And uh, and by the way, there's a tutorial that uh, that would also uh, show you how kelps look like on that. And uh, this one is a bad image, so I'm just going to go ahead and click done. Um, one of the advantages that uh, also the flooring forest has is that, for instance, when you see something like this, um, you can get go here into the metadata, and here is uh, here's the Google map for that particular uh, waypoint, and it will take you directly to wherever in the world this image is from. Uh, you see here, and um, let's just see where we are in, in the planet. Uh, it looks like Tanzania. Yes, exactly. See, so not not not, not only from from uh, from the western coast of the U.S., but also from other parts of the world. Uh, so let's just close this. And like I said, I just wanted to show you that here's a field guide. 
um, with info from of Kelps and, uh, um, the, and I should have shown you this before uh, when we started. But anyway, the, the important thing is that uh, in the field guide here, it will show you how you should be able to see Kelps or, the, or differentiate Kelps from other features in the image. You'll see that in the in the ocean. You'll see the, this uh, uh, green structures, and as the image has already been classified, and uh, and those are typical uh, uh, typical forms of uh, let's say of, of kelp forest in the somewhere in the uh, in the around the coastline, and uh, this is what I what I what I mentioned. This this one the 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 urban kelp in particular still doesn't have the feature that where you can delineate the kelp forest and then submit that. But uh, but we'll see that in a moment with the with the New Zealand one. So anyway, uh, if you go back here, there's there's a uh, uh, it shows uh, different types of images and for instance how you will how you will dif uh, see or differentiate your waves and beaches, uh, clouds are you know, obvious features that, that are pretty easy to 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 separate from others, bad or confusing images such as the ones that we just saw, uh, etc. Uh, land. Kind of typical to let's say what we're seeing here uh, in this image. So yeah, uh, you have that field guide as a reference there. So let's just go then into the uh, and I have it open in two different tabs here just for the for the sake of, of saving some time. But uh, but then let's go back and let's try to classify then um, some cups again. Uh, uh, this is a uh, this is an, uh, uh, the area. This is in particular from New Zealand, and likewise, if you click here on the uh, on the, uh, the the information tab, the metadata, it will take you to straight to to New Zealand in, in, in Google Maps, and you'll see from where uh, in particular this image is from, from where in New Zealand. And here's a let me zoom out. Here's a whole island. And uh, and uh, it seems to be from from a lake uh, in, in New Zealand. Um, just for the sake of this uh, of of this uh, uh, demo, let's assume that it's not a lake. That it's a that is a, it's a sea. There's a sea component, and I want to show you here. And uh, and the reason why I'm saying it is because uh, obviously you're not going to find kelps in lakes, but uh, a lot of time, people actually confuse them uh, in the images. For instance, what you see here, what I'm showing here with my with my cursor here, it actually looks very similar to what we just saw in the field guide. If you, we go back to the field guide, see, it's very very similar. So it could be confusing. It's always wise to go back into the metadata uh, on the, from the, this link that I showed, just to make sure that you are not uh, confusing an area where it's a lake or a river or something, and, um, and instead of uh, of the ocean. But again, for the for the sake of of, uh, of this uh, tutorial, let's just go here and let's say that we want to classify uh, some of it. So what you will you you will try to actually delineate some of it. Um, this, for example, it, it actually gives you the the choice where if you if you're not sure of or you just want to reclassify it again, you can just click on the X here and it will just delete it and you go back again. Let's say that I wasn't really comfortable with, with that and I saw that there's a there's a little bit here. Okay. And um, if I'm happy with it, I would just click here on done. And it and that uh, that data will be submitted to 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 the to the to the system. So you are actually contributing to it. And there's a it goes into a depuration process where where some experts are uh, make sure that the, that that is actually tells what you are uh, classifying. But yeah, this is uh, again. Let me just uh, uh, delete that one. Uh, this is actually what flooring forest does, and and like I said, it's a uh, it's pretty cool. And and even if, for instance, when you go back, even when you're submitting this kind of data, well, just it's pretty, yeah, you know, just kelp, no kelps, no kelps, in the image, you are actually contributing to to uh, as a citizen scientist uh, with some data. 
So feel free to uh, to go into uh, flooring forest. You will see, for instance, some of the other pictures that I just wanted to point out very briefly here is just you'll see some of the classifications. And for instance, here's a, what I was uh, uh, mentioning. Let's just see an image that I that it seems to have uh, kelps in this area, right? Very similar to what we what we saw in the field guide. Uh, here's the image, and this is what I was saying. It's, it's supposed to be an image that is already classified, so it's part of the, those, let's say, 100% completed. But you will see that there's at least several people that have classified this image in, in different ways. You can even take a look at each of them and see how, let's say, this person managed it to, to, to classify it. And, uh, and you see, you might even see some differences between the between the, the different classifications. So again, feel free to to go into flooring forest, uh, explore the uh, the tool, and uh, as I said, you will be contributing to to this uh, particularly neat project that has been going on for some years, uh, funded by NASA. So hopefully you enjoyed it, and let's continue. Now, another citizen science ocean related project is uh, Fjord Fido. And in a moment, we will hear about uh, in great detail about Fjord Fido from Alison uh, Kruzik. But before that, let me give you some general details about this uh, magnificent uh, project. Now, Fjord Fido has uh, four main uh, objectives. Uh, it aims are at determining uh, seasonal and also interannual changes in the meltwater intrusion in fjords and coastal embayments. And this is very important also for characterizing phytoplankton community diversity, as, uh, and specifically for fjord phyto um, during the austral growth, meaning uh, usually between November and March. Now, Fjord Fido aims also at engaging visitors uh, on collection of scientific data and the uh, creation of a very valuable time series data set. And it also aims at increasing ocean literacy among the visitors uh, through education and participation in citizen science activities, as in the, in the photo on the right hand side. And <clears throat> it does it by leveraging vessels that are used by the Antarctic tourism industry as uh, platforms. Now, uh, each year, there are thousands of, of tourists that visit the Antarctic Peninsula to admire the local fjords and, and the spectacular marine life in, the, in those waters. And, uh, and Fjord Fido uh, gathers uh, phytoplankton community data through biological samples uh, collected by the by the citizen scientists, and they use this data for species identification, for set up abundance uh, counts, uh, you know, measuring or estimating carbon biomass, and also to estimate the euphoric depth, uh, which is the depth at which uh, one percent of the light uh, reaches in the in the in the water column. Uh, it's, and it's done through diverse sites uh, in the in the Western Antarctic uh, Peninsula. Now, it has a through fear fight or the citizens first they are trained uh, so that they become familiarized with sampling protocols for for particularly for collecting uh, phytoplankton samples. They they're also trained in how to use what are known as CTDs or conductivity temperature depth uh, measurements. CTD is an instrument that that, that collects uh, those types of data in the in the water column. They are also trained in on how to estimate what's known as secchi depth to calculate the the euphoric depth. This is a very simple instrument that they throw overboard and they. They they see they measure until they when they when they can't see it anymore in the water column, and then that gives you an idea of the turbidity or, or on on the contrary on the clarity uh, of the water. Now they they also do uh, plankton uh, net toss to to collect uh, phytoplankton uh, community samples, 
also measure sea surface uh, temperature and, so, uh, and also collect samples in the, at the water surface. And they can also take a look at a very basic phytoplankton microscopy so that they become familiarized with, uh, with the phytoplankton communities in such uh, cold waters. But it is uh, uh, an hour's promise. Uh, uh, let's hear more details on, on fuel phyto from Alison Kusik from the University of California in San Diego. Alison is finishing her PhD at UC San Diego, and we are very glad to have her here uh, with us today. So welcome, Alison, and take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is Alison Cusick. I'm a polar biologist and oceanographer at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and I am part of the Fjord Fido citizen science team. So today I'm going to be talking with you about Fjord Fido, engaging tourists to understand polar phytoplankton dynamics using field and satellite observations. Fjord Fido is a citizen science project that's developed as a partnership between scientists in the United States and Argentina and the Antarctic travel industry. Each year, travelers come visit the Antarctic Peninsula every year, November through March, and this is a project that has been funded by NASA for the last two years. So why are we interested in the Antarctic Peninsula? Our focus is on the Antarctic Peninsula because here there have been some of the fastest rates of warming recorded. This includes the ocean and air temperatures. They have been increasing over decades, and this rise in temperature has caused 87% of the glaciers along the peninsula to retreat. This retreat of glaciers means that bedrock is now exposed. Additionally, the meltwater that comes from the glacier or this freshwater is coming into the coastal ecosystem, and this can alter the food web. The wildlife patterns are changing, as noted in the penguin populations, the seal populations, additionally the whales, and in the marine environment with the zooplankton. Conservation decisions in Antarctica are based in research or the best available data that we have access to. And Antarctica is a harsh environment to operate in. You can't always put buoys in the water. They get ripped out by icebergs. There are high winds. And also there's high cloud coverage. So the ability to get consistent data from remote sensing is challenging when there are clouds always in the way. So collaboration in Antarctica is powerful. Effectively, the more eyes on the ground you have, the more observations and data you can collect. Here I'm showing an image of some phytoplankton that we have observed in the samples that have been collected with the Fjord Phyto Project. And I also am showing an image of some travelers that have joined in a rubber inflatable boat for a science boat activity or the Fjord Phyto sampling program. And our project questions ask, what is the spatial extent of the glacial meltwater influenced region over the melting season so when the sunlight returns in Antarctica after a long winter, that's when the melting season starts to occur. And then the second question is, what is the impact of glacial meltwater input on the phytoplankton abundance and community composition? In other words, does meltwater or the freshwater coming from glaciers influence the species of phytoplankton we see, the major types, the sizes, and how the populations are shifting over the season and also where along the peninsula are we seeing these effects? And why is that important? Well, phytoplankton are photosynthesizing plant-like organisms. They produce oxygen, they convert inorganic carbon to organic carbon biomass, and they're basically the base of the food web. Here I'll go over the basic sampling strategy of Fjord Fido, and then in the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about what's happening. So you can see in the schematic that the data and the samples that we collect um, come from a CTD, or conductivity temperature depth device that is measuring surface salinity. 
temperature, as well as a, a sensor on the side that measures chlorophyll A, these CTD profiles are taken from the surface to 100 meters depth. Additionally, participants in this project are lowering a SECI disc, which can give us a euphotic depth or light level information. And they tow a phytoplankton net behind the boat. This is how we can concentrate the surface seawater or the phytoplankton and then uh, filter down that sample and extract the DNA and RNA for genetics analysis later and look at the diversity of species we see as well as a genetic response the community might be having to the environment. We also take a surface seawater sample for microscopy. So the parcel of water that's captured in this sample, we can look under the microscope and get species identification, do traditional taxonomic identification, and use the morphology to estimate carbon biomass contribution to the ecosystem. We can also take beautiful images of phytoplankton, as you saw in the previous slide, and we can get quantitative information, abundance counts of how many cells or individual species per volume of water. We additionally take a meltwater uh, sample from the surface seawater, where we can send that off to the lab to be analyzed for oxygen isotopes. And the oxygen isotope signature can tell us something about the origin of the freshwater we might see on the surface. This in situ sampling, when we're there in the environment, we can collect these samples and effectively pair them with satellite data remote sensing products back uh, and when we're out of the field season. So in order to have this program running on multiple ships throughout the year, we train guides or polar guides that work on the ships. Before each season, we have these guides uh, go through our protocols. And then while they're working on the ship, they facilitate the project in the field with the travelers that are coming and going throughout the season. So here's where the citizen science is really taking place in Antarctica. You can see in the video example, it's Martina, my colleague, and myself, um, and they're interacting with the travelers. We have a personal chance to go down and engage directly, and each person gets to participate in an element of the data collection. This program takes about one hour to collect everything, so it fits within the itinerary of the tour expedition vessel's um, overall voyage. And it allows the participants to really have an immersive experience where they can ask questions, they can understand how the first level of scientific observation and data collection is accomplished and play a hands-on role in polar science. So in the Feared Phyto Citizen Science Project, we have the operators, the ships, the trained staff, and the travelers participating. Back on board the ship, we continue the outreach with a variety of communication styles. So we can have our immersive environment engagement in the field. And then back on board, we give lectures on the ship. We can also host workshops where we can take the samples that we collected from the water and look under the microscope so that the participants can learn more about the phytoplankton and see how they influence the entire ecosystem. And during the entire voyage, they're also learning from the other guides about the ice, the geology, the whales, seals, penguins, the history of Antarctica and how conservation uh, occurs down there. We can understand phytoplankton through various methods. Pictured here on the left is a composite image of chlorophyll A from the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometry Suite or VIRS. Uh, from the SNPP uh, partnership. And this composition is of two weeks worth of data because typically, as I had mentioned, it's cloudy on the peninsula. This is a pretty good idea of where the chlorophyll levels might be highest, but we don't always get that type of information. So when we do our phytoplankton net toes in the top panel, you can see here, just by color, we do see different levels of chlorophyll A. When we look under the microscope, you can see that just because you might have a dark, rich chlorophyll A sample doesn't always translate to the same species of phytoplankton that we actually see assembled in that sample. So when we pull up the net toe, we can verify what species are actually making up 
this community of phytoplankton and see how that's changing over the entire season. Additionally, the more field data that we're able to gather, we can match with other remotely sensed optical signals, and that can help us develop robust machine learning algorithms, generally speaking. So specifically in the Fjord Fido project, we collect the meltwater sample where we get that analysis of the oxygen isotopes. And we can also collect the salinity from the CTD. And the, this ultimately supports a development of a predictive meltwater algorithm that our colleagues are working on. And here in this figure, you see uh, three panels the left panel showing the meltwater fraction at the surface or amount of glacial meltwater. The middle panel showing chlorophyll A concentration. And the panel on the right is showing sea surface temperature in Celsius. And then each row is a different month. So December, January, and February, which are really the, the central season, summer season in Antarctica. So this is showing monthly climatology of the Southern Hemisphere's summer months from 2010 to 2020. And this shows that glacial meltwater could potentially impact the chlorophyll A levels. And we're looking at how that might also be related to sea surface temperature. So the more samples we're able to gather, it's in a way ground truthing and validating um, these predictive algorithms. Some of the highlighted results so far from this study, um, we have documented more than 85 genera of phytoplankton. So total number has been recorded to be around 500 marine protists in the Southern Ocean, 350 of which are phytoplankton. So this is uh, generating a coverage of the types of genera we are finding in the coast or the near shore coastal region. And we have also documented the first dinoflagellate bloom with more than 6 million cells per liter of water. That's the image shown on the right upper panel. Um, and we described possible new species. So some of the species we're seeing in our samples have never been observed in the peninsula or described before in the literature. And additionally, between years um, and different locations, we're observing different patterns of the seasonal succession. So which phytoplankton are starting the season off and how that changes all the way through March. In the bottom panel on the left, I'm also showing the size differences of phytoplankton. So on the very left, you have a smaller flagellated phytoplankton compared to a large centric or the um, circular looking diatom, which provides much more carbon biomass to the ecosystem than say a smaller phytoplankton might. So understanding how these size shifts um, are changing can also help us understand something about um, what's available for the ecosystem. So far, we've been running this program for six years and sampling at 33 unique sites along the peninsula, which is dependent on where the tour expedition ships go each season. We're building a seasonal time series and engaging the travelers that come down at the same time. So in any one given summer, there might be 5,000 researchers from all the nations working in Antarctica in the summer months. And there are predicted to be 100,000 travelers coming down. So that's more than 10 to one traveler to scientists. So an opportunity to engage this community is a really amazing way to connect people to the polar science and actually contribute to what's going on in one of the most important regions of the world. So this um, project has been uh, including thousands of people um, if each sampling event can hold about 10 people and we have hundreds of sampling events, that's a lot of people that have been able to participate and this project's growing and we're really proud to see that it's expanding and connecting citizen science field efforts with the remote sensing uh, data sensors. With that, I wanna thank you for your attention. We look forward to connecting with you during the question and answer session and please find us on social media and engage further. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Alison, for such uh, valuable information about Fjord Fido, uh, such a cool project. Now, let's talk a bit about another NASA-funded citizen science uh, project. In this case, it's focused on lakes. 
It's called Lake Observations by Citizen Science, Scientists and Satellites, or LOCS. LOX is an international project with a number of institutions uh, involved, including the University of North Carolina, Tennessee Tech, and the University of Washington, along other uh, international entities. Um, LOC is aimed at uh, involving citizens into monitoring variations in lake heights uh, to estimate the, the volumes of water uh, in those lakes over time using uh, different gauges. And the project is, uh, currently monitors lakes in, in different states, and they are they're, uh, mentioned there. Uh, uh, Illinois, Massachusetts, uh, New Hampshire, uh, New York, North Carolina, Washington. And it also has a number of international, international sites, including sites in Bangladesh, in France, in India, in Canada. There are new sites in Chile that are being incorporated, and also in Nepal, and even in Pakistan. So it's a, it's a really important, really cool, really nice project that uh, collaborates with not only local agencies, uh, but also NGOs to install lake gauges and to uh, provide maintenance uh, to them and also measure, like I said, measure the, the, the heights uh, to estimate the water volume content of those uh, specific lakes. Now, what, uh, what it does uh, is that uh, it combines uh, measurements provided by, by, by citizen scientists um, with surface water, surface area uh, estimates derived from satellite data. So you can see that this is one of those projects that combines both citizen scientists on the field and also Earth's observations from, from, from different sensors. Um, then variations in water volume uh, over time are estimated based, based on, the, on the lake heights. And it also even, even has a newsletter, a monthly newsletter with updates from the, all the different study sites. And, uh, and it also talks about potential ex, uh, expansion to other places as well. Um, and so far, the, despite uh, the COVID outbreak uh, in, in the last years, there are more than 35,000 measurements that have been done throughout the world by citizen scientists in, in this project. Here's a, here's a link. To the to the website, and I encourage everyone to take a look at it. So another aspect of uh, of logs is that uh, it has an application, a citizen science, citizen based application, where, that is actually used to test the accuracy of satellite measurements of lakes uh, extension, and uh, the application so far, I believe, it's only available for Android uh, phones. Uh, hopefully, in the future, it's also available for, available for for iPhones. And here, the citizens they download the app, uh, and then they track the lake area with their phone as they walk through the lake shore. And this obviously depends on the on the size of the lake, but they can choose to to walk the whole lake, uh, or just a portion of the lake, or even just to submit a single point, a single waypoint uh, there. But every single data uh set or data point is is useful for the researchers so uh here's a like i said here's a link to the uh to the website and then just take a, a very uh quick look at their website just to show you the well, the, the, the different sites that are already contributing data uh to uh to logs Okay, so here's uh, this is the uh, the website for for LOX, for the lakes observation by citizen scientists and, and satellites. And I just wanted to show you here's a map that, that shows uh, from where in the world that they're collecting data, and and here you can see some of the, uh, the not only the the states in the in the case of the U.S. but also the countries uh, uh, on the international side. And for instance, if you go, let's just say, let's go into Bangladesh here. It says that, uh, check this out. They're, monit they're currently monitoring more than 50 lakes in Bangladesh uh, so far. 
here's uh you can see all the gauges all the different lakes and, and where the gauges are are located you can go into each of these let's just pick one a random one just uh, to see what it shows and, uh, and here it shows uh, the, and uh, you could see the details here if you if you click on the details it will bring you to uh here is to gauge data gauge data and from in this case it's that they started collecting data around 2021 and here's just an example of the type of data that it's collected the height in meters and and also here as it is submitted by by the by the citizens and some photos of citizens contributing to to this uh, data set in the case of, of Bangladesh let's go back again see I believe that Chile is still not there they, they will soon be studying shakes in Chile um, here's some other there like I mentioned there's uh, data from France 16 different lakes in France three different lakes in India and some of the states also a couple of lakes in Massachusetts um, 19 lakes in the, in New Hampshire and so forth so yeah, take a look at the at these uh, at, at the web page. Here's there's uh, not only information on the different uh, countries or states uh, that where where they're monitoring, also uh, how to contact them, how to get involved, uh, different news. Like I said, there's a monthly news newsletter, uh, also and very important. You can you can contribute to to this type of the of data. I said just. As by as simple as taking a walk through the uh, through the lake shore and uh, downloading the, the the app and just walking through the lake shore and submitting the data, you are contributing to such important uh, project. Okay, let's continue then with uh, with another citizen science based project. All right. Um, now let's uh, let's look at another uh, citizen science-based project funded by NASA uh, called NEMONET. And this is a this is a project that I am very much familiarized with since I was one of the of the co-investigators uh, of this project, and uh, and it's a really really cool one. So NEMONET stands for the Neural Multimodal Observation and Training Network for Global Coral Reef Assessment. And what it does is that it uses a, what's known as a Convolutional Neural Network, or CNN, to generate benthic habitat maps of coral reefs and other uh, associated ecosystems, like seagrasses, and, among others. And Nimonet requires curated and highly accurate uh, training data sets. Um, and with Nimonet, one of the one of the neat things about it is that citizens can classify the data either with 2D images collected by satellites, uh, satellite sensors, or in 3D images that are uh, collected with very high resolution cameras. As uh, uh, and, and depending on the on the on the level of expertise of the of the citizen, and with the three D images in particular, they can rotate the images uh, on a three hundred and sixty degrees or north or south, uh, whatever. And uh, the three D images are pretty much a, a mosaic of of, of of images, high resolution images that were collected in the field, in in, in some of the field sites in uh, for Nimonet. Uh, there, so far, there are more than 70,000 classifications that have been submitted by citizen scientists uh, so far through the through the NEMONET application. Now, uh, NEMONET, like I said, is a, a fun game or application. We call it a game. It's an it's an application for for global coral reef classification, and it trains the users to accurately identify benthic categories are at different levels. It goes from the very broad geomorphology categories, such as uh, something as simple as saying, this is a coral reef, this is a seagrass area, this is a, a sandy uh, patch, versus very advanced 
uh, uh, data sets where people uh, that are more, that have a, a much uh, uh, bigger expertise or if they become more and more experts, they can classify some of the 3D images in particular up to the, in terms of taxonomic levels, up to the family level, in part, particularly for, for corals, which is something that has never been done before which with, with this kind of, a, of, of application. And uh, very importantly, through this, it generates high resolution and habitat labels from the sub-centimeter, uh, very high resolution to middle scale. And it allows the users to edit or even rate other users' classifications. And this helps improving the segmentation accuracy uh, of, the, uh, of the data set. So far, NemoNet includes uh, data from Guam, from Hawaii, from American Samoa, from Puerto Rico, and there's some data also from the Indian Ocean provided by the Living Ocean Foundations. Originally, NemoNet was uh, 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 only available for iPhones, for, for iPhones and iPads, and now it's also uh, available for Android systems. And it, uh, to help the, uh, the user, it contains a field guide to help uh, them uh, identify benthic features uh or or other components like i said even to the taxonomic family level which is which is pretty advanced um like i mentioned before in particularly for the 3d data they can rotate the images uh, to help them fill in the blanks some in particular some hard to reach areas uh, within the image and uh and then it uses different number of metrics to evaluate and filter the user classifications and measures uh users uh, agreeance and also, uh, it has a number of, 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 of very nice features where as you, be, as you advance more and more in the, uh, become more and more advanced with the, with the application, um, you get uh, prices in, in, in quotes. And, uh, and, and it's, it's a really, really fun application that, uh, that it's, it's, uh, it's available for, like you said, anywhere from, from K to gray. It doesn't matter the age. It's a fun application to work with, to play with, and at the same time, you are most importantly, you are contributing to the classification, to a global classification of coral reefs, which are obviously one of the most important marine ecosystem, coastal marine ecosystems uh, in the world. So let's just let's take a look at the at a very quick uh, video. It's about two minute video on Nemonet. Uh, before that, I want to encourage any everyone to go into the Nimonet uh, webpage, uh, nimonet.info. There are the links uh, to the Apple Store and the Google Store, and uh, from where you can you can download the, the the application and get much more information about the team, about the purpose of Nimonet, and about how to contribute to to such important projects. What if you could help NASA create a map of the ocean floor with just the tip of your finger? The ocean, teeming with life. It defines our blue planet, drives our ecosystem, and regulates our climate. Coral reefs are one of the most diverse and important systems in the ocean. They're also becoming an important source of medicines for some of the world's deadliest diseases. But they are dying at unprecedented rates due to rising temperatures. But we don't know how much we're losing or how much our climate is changing. We can't until we determine how much healthy reef exists now. And the only way we can know that is with your help. NASA NemoNet is a game where you classify the world's coral reefs by painting on real life images scanned from the ocean floor using a revolutionary instrument that lets us see beneath the waves at unprecedented resolutions. Our oceans are so vast, it would take us two million years to classify the world's coral reefs by hand. The classifications you create are sent to our teams of NASA scientists at home base to teach our supercomputer to classify coral reefs on a global scale. Every contribution you make brings us closer to solving this problem. Join the NASA team to help us understand these amazing ecosystems. Take command of your research vessel and learn about all the different types of coral.
We must keep the ocean alive. It supports our life as we know it. Together, we can create a global data set of coral reefs and build a better understanding of how to save these aquatic worlds, one piece of coral at a time. Good luck, and welcome to the NASA NemoNet team. All right, so um, we will we will we will go now into the uh, question and answer uh, portion. But before that, let's go. Let's do a, a brief summary about what we talked about today. Um, citizen science obviously has become an important component of, of uh, also of ocean and coastal and inland uh, water body research. Um, for instance, projects like flooring forests, like we see, like we saw, uh, help researchers study the largest marine biome uh, on Earth, the kelp forest, at unprecedented levels um, with the help of citizens. Your Fido, as we heard from Allison, engages tourists uh, in oceanographic sampling of the southern seas and also aids in the understanding of critical phytoplankton uh, populations. Also projects like LOX uh, prove uh, these citizen science activities can be done at a national and also an international levels. And games like Nimonet are not only an educational tool capable of engaging citizens of all ages, but also to help collect data from remote areas where coral reefs particularly provide critical ecosystem services and collect data from some such important uh, ecosystems throughout the world. Now, like I said, we will go now into the uh, into the Q&A portion. If you have further questions, you can contact myself uh, or my RSET colleagues, uh, Amber or Brittany, uh, the email addresses that, that we're listing here. As a reminder, here's a, here's a course website where you can find uh, all the materials, including the PowerPoint presentations and also the videos. Um, the home uh, the homework link will, like I said, will become available uh, during the final session. And I've also included here the primary RSET web page. Uh, I encourage you guys to go uh, go into the web page and um, just uh, search for all the different uh, webinars that we have done in the last years or so. You'll see the variety of them and and check out all those great trainings. Uh, remember that uh, uh, the materials are available, freely available to, to anyone. And uh, also feel free to consult our sister programs, DEVELOP, which uh, like we've mentioned in the first, during the first uh, session, is DEVELOP is a capacity building program for, for uh, students and research grads on the use of remote sensing for, for uh, studying and to study environmental issues. And also CERBIR, which is a collaboration between NASA and USA. Um, and lastly, uh, feel free to follow us on Twitter at NASA RSET to also stay tuned and get information about upcoming trainings uh, from the RSET team. So now let's move on to the Q and the Q&A session. And thank you so much for participating today. Okay, thank you, Juan, and everyone for that really fantastic session today. As we move into the Q&A document, we're going to be showing this on the screen here. But I also want to recognize that we have some really great panelists online with us today who can help us answer these questions. So um, as you heard, we had Allison Cusack and Rick Reynolds from Scripps University Institution of Oceanography and Martina Mascioni from the Natural Sciences Museum at the National University of La Plata, Argentina. And they're here uh, representing the Fjord Fido project. Uh, we also have a few folks um, from the, the Globe Observer here, and you'll hear about their work um, in the next session, but we have Rusty Lowe from the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies and the Science Lead for the NASA Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper, 
and Peter Nelson from Oregon State University and the Science League for NASA Globe Observer Land Cover Tool. And uh, Rusty and Peter were uh, uh, graciously with us for the first session to help us with the Q&A as well. So I just want to recognize everyone here and um, we'll be jumping over to you all and feel free to, to jump in at any point to come in and answer some of these questions. So thank you so much for your time. Okay, let's jump right into it. So question one, um, I also want to mention, uh, we'll be going through the questions here, talking about them and transcribing them, and we'll post this document onto the course website um, within about a week or so. So if you don't get your question answered or you want to have some of this for reference, you can always come back to the RSET website at a later date. Great. So question one asks what kind of subsets are provided to citizens and how are citizens helpful for studying the area? Uh, we assume that this is referring to floating forest and um, the citizens are provided with 20 by 20 subsets of an image collected during a Landsat overpass. And this is done to simplify things as the whole image is, is really large. And as we showed, citizens can just say whether there is kelp or no kelp, and in some instances, delineate an area where kelp patches seem to occur. Um, Allison, Martina, uh, Rick, or is there anything else you'd like to add here? Uh, Amber, this is one. Just, just wanna wanna mention also that uh, that in the in the uh, in the presentation, we I believe we included a link to to a paper that uh, that talks specifically about all the details on how these uh, images, particularly for floating forests, how they are uh, produced. But uh, yes, we will include that link here uh, uh, in the in the final version of of this Q and A document. Great, thank you so much, Juan. Okay, and I guess we'll just move on to the next question. And uh, oh, oh. Hello. This is Allison. Hi, Allison. Um, I, hello. I could add a little to that. Um, for the Fjord Phyto Project in Antarctica, we can provide through a Google Drive link uh, images of chlorophyll satellite data with the VIRS SNPP. Um, and then while they're out in Antarctica, they if they have enough internet, they can sometimes access those to kind of see what the latest weekly composite is. Um, and understand if that's matching what they're seeing when they actually collect a sample from the water. So I hope that helps answer more of that question. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Okay, we'll move on to question two, um, also centered around uh, floating forest. Um, how was the graphical interface for floating forest projects created? And did the involvement of citizens include designing the interface for visualizing the data? Um, and so this interface was created by the project team, and um, we believe the, the citizens were not necessarily involved in the design, um, but the contact info for the project leads is also on the website, um, and they can be contacted for additional details. Um, Juan, is there anything else you'd like to mention there? No, no. Um, that's uh, that's from from. It is my understanding that it was a uh, uh, Tom Bells and and Carl Kavanaugh's, uh group, among others, who actually uh, you know created the uh, the tool. But like uh, like we pointed out in here, and as you pointed out, uh, 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 Amber, uh, the their contact info is there on the web page, and um, and people feel really feel free to you know contact them uh, if you if you like additional additional information. Okay, great. And I think question three also refers to floating forests. And the question is, can we transfer these into Google Earth Engine or download raster data for further analysis? Um, and the, I think we gave a similar answer here where uh, you could contact the researchers uh, for obtaining data for further analysis. Uh, we also highlighted another um, project that was created by the same team called Kelpwatch. Um, and we highlighted this in a past training about monitoring aquatic vegetation. And here the citizens can download CSV files with data from a specific site. And I see that one of our panelists, uh, Rick, is also um, typing in 
uh, a part of an answer here as well. So I'll, I'll pause and see if Rick or anyone else would like to comment more here. Hi, Amber, this is Peter Nelson. And I want to kind of highlight here that that really, you know, Floating Forest is one of many projects that's using the Zooniverse platform that really does provide that nice graphical user interface that has been tested. And, um, and so they have some guiding principles about how to set up some of these projects that have people volunteering their time and looking at, at a variety of images, including um, satellite images or ground-based uh, images. And, um, and, and a lot of that, you know, then can get transferred through APIs and other things like that into and combined with satellite imagery in whatever platform that you're using to do that analysis. So there are kind of two different operations that are happening. Um, and, and it really requires a, a, a team, a research team to help make that connection between um, what is happening on a platform like Zooniverse um, and actually be able to move that into an analysis environment um, where you're doing your satellite analysis. Um, and I'd say, you know, from a research point of view, you know, being able to get those two things linked a little bit better um, is some of the things that are happening through a variety of, um, you know, collaborations uh, because we do see it as a problem that we kind of have two different uh, platforms that we're having to work in. Great, thank you so much, Peter, for that um, uh, insight. And and yeah, I will say, as somebody who has used Google Earth Engine for for my projects and uh, the creation of a um, API uh, sort of user interface that builds off of Google Earth Engine um, can be one way to sort of make those linkages. Um, but there are a lot of limitations, right, with what you can do in Earth Engine versus what you can do in, in um, something like Zooniverse and, and others. And so um, how do you pull together the um, sort of the really important and useful aspects of, of each of those platforms um, to make something useful? Um, and, and I also see that, that Rick is typing in here um, a, a response, um, and he mentions in Fiora Fido, uh, they used Google Earth Engine to develop the machine learning algorithm for detecting meltwater content in the surface seawater. And then um, this algorithm will eventually be peer reviewed and um, the products will be available through the platform as well. So that's another um, sort of process that can be done to um, connect these different types of analysis platforms. So thank you. Okay, I think we'll move on then to question four. This question asks, is this manual classification data used in floating forest to train AI models? Um, and is it anything similar to the RLHS model used by chat G GPT? Um, and we've typed in some answer here. Uh, yes, the data is used to train the models among other purposes. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with the, the model mentioned here, but it's something we could look into. Um, if any other panelists uh, are familiar with this model or have anything to add, feel free to chime in here. I will mention a number that in the not necessarily for uh, for floating forest, but also uh, for instance for Nemonet, which is uh, uh, kind of a similar project that we mentioned towards the end. Uh, we uh, that's exactly what happens. Uh, the the data uh, is eventually you know it's uh, depurated to to a, a process and it's sent through the uh, convolutional neural ne network uh, eventually. And uh, in case of Nemonet, it uses NASA supercomputer. For for uh, for uh, for for that analysis, and uh, we um, <clears throat> again also in one of the slides we provided the link to uh, Jared Spandenberg's uh, paper from uh, I believe it was 2021 uh, on on Nimonet, and that one goes into uh, specific details about how the the data is eventually used uh, to train the uh, the AI uh, models. Among other things, uh, you know, it also has a very interesting data on, on for instance, how 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 similar or how different are the classifications from different citizens, um, and uh, for uh, for a particular coral reef scene, uh, 
uh, among other uh, other other types of data uh, as well. So uh, yes, that, that that is a that is a, a paper that uh, that we highlighted, and it's uh, it's obviously it's, it's freely available. It's open access. Great, thank you so much, Juan, uh, for the additional info there and the paper. Okay. Um, so I think we'll we'll go on here to question five. Question five asks, what did the global distribution of Cub look like? And what informed the choice of the areas currently under study? So kelp are temperate water organisms. And in the case of floating forests, the main area of study was the west coast of the US, mostly because the researchers have been working there for uh, many years. And um, there were also local government entities to help monitor the health of those ecosystems there. Um, Juan or others, is there anything else you'd like to add here? Um, there's a, like, 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 like we mentioned, you know, kelps, are, you know, and just in as a general ecology and biology of kelps, they are they're temperate water organisms. And uh, so they're from different, uh, along different coastlines uh, throughout the uh, the world, as we mentioned, it's, it's, it's currently being classified as probably the, the biggest marine biome uh, in the whole world, about 36% of all. Uh, coastlines are, are are covered by by kelp, so they're they're, they're really really important. Um, and we uh, yeah, in the in the case of the the, the floating forest uh, team, they they work specifically in the on the west coast of the U.S. But as we saw in the in the short demo, they they're also adding uh, <clears throat> data from from other sites like uh, New Zealand uh, among others. Great, thank you, Juan. Okay, uh, moving on to question six here. Question six asks, can you describe some of the best practices to build into program design so that citizen science projects can financially support scientific research? I'm thinking of the Fjord final project where I assume ecotourists are paying something to participate. Um, and I saw Allison and some others um, typing in here. So Maybe I'll, I'll pause and offer you up the chance to speak, or I can read the answer if you'd like as well. I could elaborate on the answer that's already typed in, but some of the, so the way Feared Fido is operated already in conjunction with programming that's on board the ship. So the travelers have already paid to go on their trip in general, and then on board they discover that science boat is uh, something they can participate in. Some of the operators are following a model where portion of the traveler's ticket price is funneled into, say, like a foundation that scientists could apply for mini grants to, or um, the operators themselves are partitioning some of their funding towards supporting science and scientists. Um, but in general, Fjord Fido is funded from federal grants um, in the past, the National Science Foundation, and currently with NASA, and then also donation-based if participants feel compelled to donate to uh, this project. Great, thank you, Allison. Really um, unique connection between ecotourism and, and funding for science. So that's really interesting to hear. Is there anything else other panelists would like to add here? Okay, great. We will move on to question seven then. Question seven asks, how are the Landsat images used for community-based data, enhanced for field data collection, especially for people who are not remote sensing scientists? And um, we've typed in a short answer here. Usually, as in the case of floating forests, the images are presented to the citizens and they're already processed in most cases. And um, for many of these applications, cloud-free images are used as, as um, oftentimes clouds can get in the way of seeing uh, the things that we're looking for um, on the ground and in the water um, on the earth. Um, I'll pause if anyone would like to add additional um, context to this answer. 
Hi, Amber, this is Peter Nelson. And I do remember seeing a couple of years ago a presentation about um, this question actually at, at a conference. And so I was also kind of interested in this. And so I do know that they do some pre-processing to enhance the ability for detection of kelp because it is in water. So you have to deal with um, you know some of the specular reflection and, and some of that sort of thing. And so they, they do some of that pre-processing um, that you know usually a, a, a remote sensing specialist would be doing on their personal computer to enhance the image to be able to identify and, and see those edges in particular um, around that. And so, you know, that is a really important piece of, of, of presenting any remote sensing image to a non-specialist if you're looking for something that, um, you know, is on one end of the digital number spectrum that you do need to do that enhancement to really be able to uh, detect the object that you're after. Um, and so, you know, that's one of those things that 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 I know was done in that pre-processing to particularly enhance that ability to detect the floating forest kelp objects um, that is unique to that, that, you know, probably isn't, it wouldn't work for glaciers or for another sort of, of object. And so, you know, in that case, again, you, you, you want to be thinking about what is the best enhancement to your imagery that makes it detectable to any image analyst, whether they're, they're trained or not. And I do know in their, in their field guide, they talk about how to detect and identify uh, kelp edges and, and, and what, the, what they're actually um, asking people to look for. So, um, you know, it's kind of that, that way um, is, is kind of the, the way that they've ha handled that uh, pre-processing of the images um, pre, you know, before they hand them to Zooniverse and, and load them up into that. So they're, you know, standard graphic files. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, uh, really good points. I think with any kind of landscape that you're um, analyzing, there are unique um, processing uh, things that need to occur. I'm thinking like sun glint on the water and in, in, in waters, in particular have unique challenges um, regarding uh, processing of, of satellite imagery. So um, any of that that can be done prior to uh, citizen science analysis is really helpful to um, improve the accuracy of, of the classification um, when that's occurring. So thank you for that. Um, okay, I think we'll move on to question eight. Question eight asks, is current research focused on the influence of human activities on the protection of kelp from degradation and extinction in certain areas of the world? Um, yes, there, there's a lot of research on this um, in the field, um, not only human activities, but climate change. Um, so much of this is, is interrelated. Um, things like heat waves um, and um, the sea urchin, um, kelp sort of connections um, as well. So there are a lot of um, issues with kelp, uh, especially along the, the US waters in terms of human influences, climate change, temperature rise, um, all sorts of, of issues there. Um, I do believe Juan had to leave us, but if anyone would like to comment further on this question, I'll pause. Okay, um, on to question nine. Um, I think that this was partially answered in a previous previous question as well, um, as we elaborated on some of the uh, processing and algorithm development. But the question asks, is the training of the algorithm for machine learning and the creation of visual maps in the citizen science and remote sensing project carried out by the volunteers, or is it the responsibility of the um, project founder? So, yeah, this is usually a step done by the researchers um, in doing the, some of the more heavy lift in, in terms of algorithm development, the sheet machine learn, learning, the processing of imagery. Um, I think it varies project to project in terms of the different levels of involvement um, in analysis and classification that the citizen scientists can be engaged in. Um, but a lot of the more technical pieces are often handled by the researchers. Would anyone else like to comment on this question? A 
Okay, we will move on to question 10 here. Um, and it looks like we have a, a nice answer uh, typed in here already for us. But the question asks, could you please share if you see any positive attitudes or consequences after the tourists participated in the data collected at the Fjord project? Um, they still try to connect. Did they still try to connect or engage with the project afterwards? So um, we have a nice um, answer here that folks can read. Um, I'll pause and see if. Um, Allison or others would like to elaborate on this at all. Hi. Um, yeah, so it, in the early years, you know, it was just initially interesting to see if people enjoyed the activity in general, to see if it was something we could build capacity around with the operators in Antarctica. And from that information, we had a flood of testimonies from people saying it was the first time they'd felt a childlike spark of curiosity, or it gave them a sense of tangible um, participation in a region of the world that was so uh, large and hard to comprehend um, just because of the scale of, of the place. Um, and so we get a lot of people connecting with us on social media, which is why we try to stay very active um, because of the reason that we don't get to personally meet or um, know who is participating in our project. So they can follow up and find us, which has been uh, an incredible way to stay engaged and then also share all the results we have from the project and build a community online after their trip. Great, thank you, Allison. Yeah, uh, really exciting to see uh, and hear about uh, folks having a new spark of interest in their uh, natural environment and engagement. Um, really, really cool to see. Um, so I think with that, we are um, at time for our session today and um, leaving on a really positive note there, I would just wanna thank again our panelists and guest speakers for contributing to this, this series. It's been really great to have you online and engaging um, in these questions um, as well. And we have we do have a few extra questions here on this document, so we'll answer what we can and provide this to you all um, within about a week or so. Um, and you can refer back to this uh, for more information in the future. And um, please do stay tuned with us. Uh, we have one more session that is occurring um, next week on Tuesday, where you'll hear more about some really fantastic projects that focus on land applications of um, earth observations and citizen science. So thank you all for being with us today. And um, we are looking forward to seeing you and joining us on Tuesday of next week as well. So do take care, everyone.